Daryl Rivers is joining me today. He is a United States military veteran as well as a retired law enforcement professional having worked for both the Detroit Police Department as well as the Arizona Department of Corrections. Daryl, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, I appreciate you inviting me to your space and uh, having a conversation. Of course. Now, earlier this week, we saw in Columbus, Ohio, a 16-year-old girl shot and killed by police officers. I'm going to play the body camera footage for us now, and I want to get your reaction to the situation itself, as well as your thoughts on whether or not the police officer could have used um, a less lethal form to sort of de-escalate the situation. So let me pull that up for us now, and we can get started. Now, uh, I can tell you from the perspective of a law enforcement professional, uh, as far as uh, the training that we receive concerning the utilization of what we call deadly force. Deadly force can be the use of a firearm or any other type of weapon and or hands-free, I'm sorry, uh, no weapon, you know, just hands-on kind of situation to where it can cause serious bodily injury and or ultimately death. Bottom line is we are only authorized or we're trained to where the utilization of deadly force uh, is specific to when an officer feels as though he himself or her herself is in immediate danger concerning great bodily harm or potentially loss of life. Secondly, if an individual is utilizing some form of force towards another person not being that officer, so whereas that individual could experience in the same, uh, the same thing, great bodily harm or loss of life. Now, I believe that when we look at the video, we can truly see that, you know, the person had a weapon. Uh, it seems as if she was lunging and attacking that the other person in question. Uh, and she was going to use that weapon in order to inflict great bodily harm and potentially death. At this, when, I, when I'm looking at this, just about every single law enforcement professional that I know that I've worked with, that I have had the opportunity to train in defensive tactics, they probably would have made the same decision. Now, something that was asked of the interim police chief on, uh, you know, shortly after the shooting itself was, it was asked by a reporter whether or not the officer involved could have used, um, I, I guess, could have aimed for, uh, you know, her leg or her arm. Um, is that something that police are, are taught? Like, where sort of are police taught to shoot, I guess, in a situation like this? We're trained in accordance with the law. And the law states if you're going to use deadly force, then we can't use deadly force to maim an individual, being I'm shooting you or I'm, I'm discharging my firearm in your direction in order to stop a particular threat. I, I'm not authorized to do that. I'm not authorized to utilize deadly force to try to maim or attempt to maim someone. Shooting someone in the leg or intentionally shooting someone in the leg, intentionally shooting someone in the arm is considered maiming. Uh, and that's the law. So law enforcement doesn't, we enforce law, we don't make it. So the police academy trains its officers in accordance to the laws that are on the books. So when we are trained within the law enforcement academies, we're trained to shoot center mass. Um, and if you shoot outside of center mass, you do not qualify. You have to continue to try to qualify to ensure that when you discharge a firearm, all of your rounds are landing center mass. Some people are wondering, though, if he could have used a taser instead of a gun. What is your What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I, I would hate to speculate and say that he couldn't use a taser. Uh, it's a possibility that he could have. Uh, generally, when we are doing our best to deal with a deadly force situation, we utilize that the same level of force in which we are trying to neutralize. So at times, you know, a taser will be effective. Uh, but I know in the police academy, we're generally taught to utilize the use of force that we're being, that we're actually encountering. At this particular juncture, 
uh, this officer was dealing with a deadly force encounter. So he met that deadly force encounter with the utilization of deadly force. As someone who you know, was in the law enforcement uh, profession, what do you think was going through that officer's head when he saw her with that knife uh, you know, lunging toward that girl in, in the pink jumpsuit? Well, I can't say what's going on in his head. I can say what would be going on in mine. And as a law enforcement professional, I would lean to believe that his actions would, you know, pretty much kind of define what he was thinking. And his thought process was, I need to save this other person's life. You know, I, it's, it's unfortunate that he's being placed under the scrutiny of shooting an individual when in actuality he should be being heralded as an as a individual who just saved another person's life. I mean, it's unfortunate that this young teenager had to succumb to uh, her injuries and, you know, she lost her life. That is extremely unfortunate and that's nothing to, to, to look past. It, it's definitely unfortunate she doesn't have the opportunity to make a better decision. Uh, but in actuality, you know, in a law enforcement profession, we are to protect the lives of others. Uh, I can only imagine if he failed to act and watched another person stab another person in that person's eyes, then there's another point of scrutiny there. Mm -hmm. so, so I believe that no matter what this officer would have done, mm -hmm. he would have been criticized one way or the other. So I feel bad for him. I feel bad for the, the family of this young lady. Uh, all parties involved. Unfortunately, this is just an unfortunate event. Yeah, of course. And anytime anyone loses their life, let alone, you know, a 16 year old girl, it's just horrible, horrible to think about. Um, and to obviously watch this incident unfold right before your eyes. Um, I, I want to ask you about this quote and, and whether or not you think race had anything to play with this shooting incident. Now, a piece for the Daily Caller News Foundation um, cites the founder of the Black Liberation Movement for Central Ohio. Now, she said that, quote, when I saw the body cam, I noticed the difference in how they police. When it comes to Black people, they do not like to de-escalate. The reaction seems to be to fear Black people who are in conflict and to just try to violently stop them. Do you think that the officer's response was in any way racially motivated? Do you think race played you know, any factor into the officer's actions? I, I, I don't see race here. It was a fast moving situation. Um, he clearly yelled, stop. There was no, there was no opportunity for dialogue. Mm -hmm. Now I'm a national de-escalation trainer. I train thousands of officers in de-escalation techniques. Um, there was no opportunity for de-escalation. At least it appeared so. Uh, there, there was no opportunity for de-escalation whatsoever. Immediately when he got out the car, there was violence already ensuing. You see that one person was knocked down. He said to her, and the other person immediately lunged to another person. Uh, the, the suspect immediately lunged to another person, uh, turning her back on the officer, not paying attention to the officer whatsoever, complete aggression directed towards the individual that was against the car. Uh, and then she attempts to assault her. At that point, I believe that if an officer would like, excuse me, ma'am, uh, would you like to talk about this? I think that that is completely out of the window. Um, also understand the perception uh, of the individual who made that statement. Uh, I, I can I can Im I can only imagine the previous incidents to where an officer possibly could have de-escalated the situation and failed to do so. So now we have that overarching factor to where every situation is that. I will tell you that by looking at this situation, that is not it. And officers had been responding to a 911 call. And as you mentioned, you know, as soon as they arrived on the scene from the body camera footage, at least there was a, another altercation, another scuffle that was going on uh, involving Brian. And then of course we see her lunge at this other girl with a knife in her hand. Now, just one final question for you moving forward. Uh, what do you think this situation has, uh, you know, does it have any implications for, you know, future future interactions between law enforcement and um, like communities? Do you think that people are less trusting of, of police officers? Where do you think, you know, policing can move forward from here? 
Well, we have a long way to go. Uh, I recall a time to where as, as a law enforcement professional, not only do we have true authority, but we have moral authority as well. And I believe with all of the events, the loss of life, uh, some of them uh, being very questionable and or definitively wrong, um, somewhere the, the moral authority begins to erode. So whenever there is a situation to where it's true authority, it's exercised in a, in, a, in a just manner, it's going to be questioned because the moral authority isn't there. All right, so, so if we were to look at right now, it's approximately 800,000 law enforcement officers that are currently employed within the United States, all, over the, all across the United States, right? And out of those 800,000, there's well over 3 million police contacts per day which sets us somewhere around north of 400 million, uh, far north of 400 million uh, law enforcement contacts per year. Unfortunately, we have some that end up in uses of force and some of those uses of forces are necessary. A lot of those uses of forces are not, okay? Of the ones that we see. So when it comes to regain or when it comes to how is it that we deal with law enforcement from this day forward, it depends on how this thing is balanced out. OK, uh, statistically, our brains deal with uh, when it comes to the positive negative ratio, it takes five positive to outweigh one negative. OK, so uh, if I have a negative feeling about something, it's going to take me at least five positives to kind of balance it out. And it depends on how severe that negative actually is. So. If I have a negative encounter with a law enforcement professional out in the street or through media, whatever the situation may be, and I am constantly seeing that over and over and over and over again, what does that weigh on and how many positives does it actually take to weigh that out? Mm -hmm. So at this point, a lot of people are seeing this as a negative. Well, it is a negative because loss of life had occurred. But when they're looking at it as far as did the officer operate within the true color of his authority? Um, some people are seeing that as a negative. So their way forward is going to be leaning on a negative side. It's mm -hmm. going to be, well, I don't want to call the police. And, you know, maybe I might have my life be in danger uh, because of um, those negative experiences or those negative views that have been put out there. Um, I truly believe that the way forward is to get involved. As a young man, I wasn't too fond of the police. I mean, I grew up in inner city Detroit and, you know, the inner city Detroit was pretty rough. And my auntie became a law enforcement professional. And I was like, oh, my God, she, she's a cop now kind of thing. But I knew she was someone that I loved that loved me. She was a regular human being. She had no malice in her heart. She just had a tough job. And it really changed my perception. This was in 1992. And then here we are in 1998. I'm in the police academy six years later. So the thing is that most people who feel negative about police officers really don't know any police officers. Mm -hmm. And if we want to change our perception of them, we have to work hard at changing our perception of them. Uh, the question is, is that what people want? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so let's we'll see. I don't think that it should be negative, mm -hmm. but in dealing with what's going on in our country right now, I can understand why. It I just wanted to talk a little bit more about if you if you have the time to. Um, you brought up sort of that you know negative you know experience that you'd have, um, and you brought up the media, and I think the media obviously. Being a reporter can play such a huge role in how these stories are presented to the public. Um, do you have any advice for me or for any other reporters out there who want to make sure that we're, you know, being as transparent as possible uh, to make sure that we, you know, are, are presenting the facts in the best possible way that we can? Oh, no, I, I truly believe that a lot of the situations that are presented, they're presented from a video camera. It's not like you guys are out there videoing it. These videos are being submitted to you and you're reporting what you're getting, okay? Um, what I think that is not just the media, it's, it's, it's more on the lines of, 
And I, I just came from teaching this class uh, on leadership. <laughs> And I was uh, speaking to some law enforcement professionals in the state of Idaho. And my plea was to try to catch people doing something right. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that right now, the entire planet is focused on catching law enforcement do something wrong, as opposed to catching someone do something right. Don't get me wrong. There is wrong out there. I, I, I will admit that. Okay, I, I love my law enforcement brothers and sisters, but I am a realist and I do, I recognize what's wrong. I love my law enforcement brothers and sisters, but I love righteousness also. Okay, so, so there are tons of people who are doing the right thing. There is a very small percentage that are not. The question is, are we going to make positivity louder than what it currently is? Because there's going to be negative, there's negativity out there. There's people who are doing wrong things and they're out there. And does that need to be reported? Absolutely. But there are people out there also that are doing the right thing. And I think that needs to be So when it comes to, you know, uh, uh, any advice mm -hmm. as far as a media outlet or platform, it's, you know, if, if I only report one thing, then people are only going to hear one thing. Uh, but yet, if I go on both sides of the line, you know, and I say, hey, this is what happened. It's unfortunate. We, we hope that this doesn't happen anymore and it has to stop. But this is also what's happening. And this is what we want to continue. This is what we want to promote. These are the individuals that we want to support. And those other ones, we do not support their actions. And I believe that that is what's essential to have in a balanced society to where they can realize that, hey, all cops aren't bad. You know, uh, I, can, I can imagine. And, and see, on the flip side of that, I, I truly believe that law enforcement has a certain stigma towards the media. Why? Because, you know, hey, I can do a million things right. If I do one thing wrong, then I'm famous. So... <laughs> It, you know, so so I think that just that balancing out, you know, for my law enforcement brothers and sisters that might be privileged to to hear this or see this, get to know your media personnel. Media personnel, get to know, get to know your law enforcement personnel. And that way, we can get a little bit of uh, a different viewpoint outside of the, the snapshot that happens within a 10 to 15 second, second video. Absolutely. And I know that the Daily Caller News Foundation has a lot of law enforcement in their audience. So hopefully yeah. they will see this video, um, you know, and, and will listen to what you're saying, uh, because it is so important. Daryl Rivers, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you coming on to break down this video for us and to provide some insight. So thanks so much. Thank you, Connie, for having me and you guys have a great day. Continue to do a good job. Thank you.